the fruit of the spirit lord will be made manifest lord in and through us god yes father god we just want to thank you we bless your name we give you all the praise we give you all the glory at this time in jesus matchless name we pray amen amen okay um okay i don't know what happened prince is somehow prince was removed from the meeting i'm sorry there somehow prince was removed from the meeting removed oh? yeah i just read the the thing on the on the screen uh okay can you just check with him if he can uh if he has any difficulty joining sure but i'll i'll call him one yeah just check with him i'm not sure how that happened Okay, we'll uh, wait for Prince to join, and then we'll start. Uh... Okay, Prince is joined. Okay, fine. Okay, let's uh, let's continue from where we stopped. We stopped at First uh, Thessalonians chapter five, and we stopped at verse eleven, right? Where Paul was talking about um, uh, about the coming of the Lord and how it will be, and he also was encouraging the um, you know the, the Thessalonic Thessalonian believers about um, you know uh, how they should live their life. right because uh, those who do not know the lord those who are in darkness are living a certain way and uh, you know they do not expect the coming of the lord and you know it, it says in verse 3 in uh, chapter 5 peace and safety when they say peace and safety then sudden destruction comes upon them you know they're not expecting the coming of the lord etc um, and uh, they're not really uh, living a life uh, that is pleasing so um it says that sudden destruction will come upon them this day will come upon them like a thief in the night um but he said you are sons of light and sons of the day so you know you don't have to fear and your life uh, let it be different let us not sleep he says as the others do you know let us not be um uh, meaning um yeah let us not be unaware let us not be uh, you know uh, blind to this let us not be without expecting the coming of the lord okay so all that um and in verse 9 the assurance reassurance is saying god did not appoint us to wrath you know, because of the shed blood of christ because of you know what uh, jesus did for us on the cross now the thing whole thing has changed because you have accepted the lord now you have not been appointed for wrath meaning you have not been appointed for condemnation you know? there is things that have happened to you and so you're not heading in that direction okay therefore comfort one another and edify one another just as you also are doing okay so um so he's saying this whole uh you know this whole truth that he's presenting about the coming of the lord about what will happen etc and he's saying you know you use you with these words you comfort and edify one another you know comfort and console one another uh because the comfort is for those who who are uh, who have passed away right so that is something that something that he addresses also in 1 Thessalonians 4 um uh, those who have um, passed away you know how what will happen to them and and all that so saying you know to comfort one another and also edify build up one another using these words okay so let's uh, move on to um verse 12 it says and we urge you brethren to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the lord and admonish you 
and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And and then the final uh, blessing and uh, greetings, right? He says after that. So he's, he's giving some instructions to the church. Uh, and he's saying, now we... Um, we exhort, we, we urge you, he says, and the word urge meaning, uh, you know, beseech or entreat and uh, saying, I urge you to recognize, right, to uh, esteem highly, uh, to recognize and esteem highly those who labor among you. He's talking about the, the leadership uh, who are there those who are laboring, who might be visiting also, and uh, who are ministering to them. Right. So he's saying those who labor among you, the brethren who are there um, and who are over you in the Lord, you know, who are maybe more mature and, uh, you know, they, you know, they labor among you and then they also admonish you, meaning they, you know, they correct you, they warn you, alert you. Now, all that is happening, um, you know, so um, they are doing that. Um, one second, sorry. Um, yeah, so they're also uh, alerting you and warning you. And uh, so he's saying you uh, esteem them highly. Verse 13, esteem them very highly in love for their for the sake of their work, for the sake of the kind of ministry that they do. And you be at peace among yourselves. Okay. Uh, so first, verse 12, he says, we beseech you, we urge you. Uh, meaning he, it, it almost like you know we beg you um, you respect those who are there you esteem them very highly for the sake of the ministry that they do because they are handling the word of God they're ministering the word of God in verse 14 he says now we exhort you okay so again that word there exhort mean, means we encourage you now this is how you do uh, we encourage you now uh, he's shifting the focus. It's not on the leadership, but it's about you know the church itself, whoever's there. Right? It's, and and he's actually warning. He's saying, warn those who are unruly. Okay, so that word unruly meaning subordinate, rebellious, insubordinate. Sorry, insubordinate, rebellious. Okay, warn them. Those who are unruly. Okay, so if people are there who are unruly, they need to be warned. Warned that. Their, their behavior and their lifestyle is uh, is not good. Okay, so they need to be warned. Then, there is a second category of people. Who are these people? They are faint-hearted. They are fearful. Okay, So, which means that uh, they are fearful of maybe persecution. You know, that was the real challenge that they were facing. Right? So, they were facing persecution. So, um, he's saying those who are faint-hearted. Okay, so who are feeble-minded, faint-hearted. What do they need? He's saying you uh, comfort them. Okay? Comfort the faint-hearted. You console them. Um, so warn a certain group of people because they are living in an unruly manner, disorderly, insubordinate. They're not listening to whatever the instructions are. Um, so you warn them to change their ways. Secondly, there are people who are faint-hearted, who are feeble-minded, comfort them. And then those who are weak need to be upheld, uphold the weak. Okay, So, um, so that is the third category of people. Um, support them, uphold them, support them. Okay, to, it, it really means to, um, to hold back or hold, uh, you know, to, to lift up and hold, support them. To, to kind of, uh, you know, to be able, so, so that they can actually lean on us, you know, that's the picture. So that um, we can give them our strength when because they do not have their own strength, right? So support them. So who are them? 
these are the weak and uphold the weak and be patient with all okay so the reality of church life okay so the reality of church life and uh, it's talking about the kind of you know the mi- different ca- mix of people who will be there in a typical church in a typical assembly or gathering you will have all these kinds and for all these kinds of people you know you need to uh, minister to them in a different way you need to address their needs differently so he's is he's, he's talking about the different kinds of needs that are there you know for some it is warnings for some it is encouragement for some it is comfort for some it is uh, you know it is to give them support and for and for all he says you be patient be patient with all because that's something that is required uh, because there you know when people are there together there is a need for patience uh, because they might say things they might do things and uh, and uh, which might stir us up to to for us to behave in an impa- impatient manner so so paul very clearly says be patient with all verse 15 see that no one renders evil for evil you know because of persecution because of some of the things that people are doing or don't retaliate don't give them back evil um so see that no one renders so, so he's saying you know let this be something like a like a culture of the church right so let it be a common understanding and expect and teaching that no one will render or deliver or to give right uh, like a like a wage that is promised uh, no one will render evil for evil okay so uh, that word evil meaning uh, something that is worthless something that is depraved something that is bad okay so evil can have many forms right um some you know, evil need not be always physical in nature like a danger to the body or um you know something that people might do physically against us you know it need not be evil can have different faces and different expressions right and in all those expressions of evil right so paul is saying you know, no one let no one render evil or give back in the same manner okay let no one render evil but but pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all okay so the opposite opposite of it uh, is what needs to be pursued or we need to go after right go after these things uh, make sure that we have those uh, in our lives uh, make sure that we express that in our interactions with people so this is all you know the church setting this is all among people with people so while because of the work of the flesh or because of the works of the enemy um, there could be evil which is done to us and again the evil is not just physical harm or physical persecution it could be very many other things whatever you know ways in which evil can be done but don't do the same thing pursue what is good okay now again just like how he wrote in philippians he writes here rejoice always okay in all circumstances in all situations rejoice uh, because the lord god is the lord of all and that's one reason why um he's able to say you know rejoice okay for he himself has uh, uh experienced that truth and the comfort of the lord and the grace of god so uh, you know and so he is able to impart that and and share that with others and saying rejoice always so it is possible in whatever circumstances and just like how they Uh, you know what we see in acts chapter 16 um and how they were in prison and how they um you know worship so it's not something that is uh, not known it's not something that uh, you know that they that they did not know or that they did not 
live in practically right so they they actually live that out so uh, saying rejoice always pray without ceasing that's another interesting thing you know, pray without ceasing uh, it means pray without stopping you know and the word used there is adeleptos in greek which means um, to continue on right to continue to pray to pray without without a break continue on and uh, and the usage of that word was uh, really uh, for in the greek it was used for someone who was coughing you know like someone is just coughing and we say you know that person is coughing continuously but actually that person would cough for some time and then there'll be a you know short pause and again that person will cough again you know, that's how you know, somebody who's suffering from some kind of an infection and they are coughing um so that would that they will say you know he's coughing continuously or coughing at a leptos right so here uh, paul is saying pray without ceasing pray at a leptos okay and uh, so he's saying this is how the, let this be the lifestyle of a believer okay to uh, pray which means uh, it's petition and uh, supplication pray without ceasing pray at electos okay uh, in everything give thanks for this is the will of god the will of god in christ jesus for you do not quench the spirit again the holy spirit is leading us the holy spirit is bringing the church to a place of perfection don't quench don't put it's like throwing uh, or pouring water on the fire to put out the fire so don't quench the work of the spirit in your life whether you know it it could, it could apply uh, whether it is individually or you know in a group in a corporately don't quench the spirit so maybe the gathered together the holy spirit is leading in a certain direction in order to do things in a certain way and uh, you know it is not done so um, don't quench don't stop right um, the work of the spirit okay then some more instructions do not despise prophecy so obviously he's taught them about the gifts of the spirit he's taught them about uh, uh, prophecies and uh, prophecy and everything and uh, just like how he has taught the corinthian church here also you know he, it has it has been taught so obviously they know about it um, what is interesting is you know in in a very short time paul seems to have just laid you know all these things as important you know all the spiritual uh, uh, realities you know baptism of the spirit and gifts of the spirit and and all that is is really necessary for the church right to hear the now word of god and to speak for the now word of god is prophecy right and prophecy brings edification exhortation and comfort for the believer and so he he you know knows the importance of that he knows the importance of being led by the spirit of god so it's not just some dead theoretical you know some principles that that you just talk about and go back or some intellectual exercise where we you know learn it and then we critique it and we say oh that was a good thing and oh this is bad and then go back home no it's not like that so he's saying you know the spirit of god is alive the spirit of god is um you know real the spirit of god wants to do certain things so let him have free reign so he's saying don't quench don't stop don't hold back and rein back the work of the um the holy spirit and you know he's saying here yeah, do not despise prophecy say hey, so don't despise prophecies because um you know there could be many reasons why prophecies could be despised because despised right uh despised meaning you know you know people hating prophecies now is it possible yeah it is possible because when there's an abuse of it right when there's an abuse of any spiritual gift it is possible that people get turned off or put off completely by anything to do with the work of the spirit you know and in, even in today's you know if you look around you see that there are people who have been hurt or there are people who have been hurt by uh, the abuse of the gifts the way they were ministered to by you know maybe they were put down they were embarrassed you know they were humiliated like people can do that you know with the not being 
not be not giving honor not ministering in a spirit of gentleness right so you be harsh and you know you uh, uh, minister the gifts in in that manner without love right because paul writes again 1 corinthians 13 is entire thing is about love meaning that hey, you need to minister from a place of love motivated by love okay so all this creates if it is not there then it this creates a this creates a problem this creates a problem for the believer they are they don't want to have anything to do with the, the work of the spirit though that is something that is very necessary that is central important for the church so saying maybe you might have come to a place of despising this so he's he's warning or he's encouraging him saying do not despise prophecies yes the gift is good well the messenger is not perfect the gift is perfect so what is the solution test all things hold fast what is good abstain from every form of evil Okay, so he's saying test all things. As uh, this is a very important guideline, as New, St New Testament believers, uh, we are not to uh, despise the gifts. We are not to despise, especially prophecy. We are not to dis um, um, quench the work of the Spirit. It needs to be there in the church. But you test all things. Test if it's genuine. Test if it's from God. Test if you know whatever is being. Uh, directed or brought in is from God and hold fast to what is good. Okay, so meaning if it is not good, it's okay, don't don't hold on to it, just let it go. Right? So when you test, there is every possibility that you find that some things are good, some things are not, maybe some things are of the spirit, some things are of the flesh. Hold fast to what is good, okay. and uh, and that word good. Uh, it's 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 also important that we that we look at that and hold fast what is good. So it means something that is beautiful, something that is fair, something that is virtuous, valuable, right? Um, so it's good in quality. Right. It's good to look at. It's excellent. So all this is there. So if it is not so, the the thing is very simple. You don't have to hold on to it. Right. You don't have to hold fast to it. You can actually let it go. So so the thing is to you need to test all things, which means to examine um spend some time scrutinizing investigating you know is it so is it according to the word of god is it according to truth uh, is it in line consistent with the nature of god character of god okay um, all those things now that is our responsibility as the new testament church so you now a lot of things happen damage happens when we don't take that responsibility ourselves, right? We or we skip that that step, and so there is a lot of lot of damage that happens. Now this instruction is for the church. Now what happens if we don't carry out this instruction? Obviously, there's a lot of damage. There is a lot of uh, hurt that happens. So saying test it, test all things, investigate, discern analyze right use your judgment and hold fast to what is excellent what is virtuous what is truthful what is beautiful hold fast to it okay let it be part of your life um you i mean let it be deeply rooted in you okay okay abstain from every form of evil every form of evil you know it might be uh, you know, uh, so the, the thing is to see all appearance, every form, in whatever way evil, you know, uh, comes. Okay. So the thing is this, 
that with every day passing day you realize that that evil is packaged in a different way okay maybe for one generation it's packaged in a different way it's for another generation it's the same evil but it's packaged in a different way right it's presented in a different way so he's Paul is saying abstain from all appearance okay it might be it might be Uh, show up in a different way it might be packaged in a different way uh, for a particular generation for a particular season but you're going to be testing all things you're going to be investigating approving discerning all things therefore you abstain you keep away from all forms of evil okay then finally now may the god of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ he who calls you is faithful who also will do it brethren pray for us greet all the brethren with a holy kiss i charge you by the lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all okay so uh, so he's saying may the god of peace sanctify you and that word their meaning set you apart completely you know because he's talking about evil things he's saying abstaining from all form of evil so he's saying may the lord himself set you apart completely and may your spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ so here we learn about how we are you know as human beings what we are composed of right how we are put together what we are made of spirit soul and body so it's not just a physical which is the body it goes beyond that it's not just the emotional it's not just the soul right so it is it goes beyond that it is also of the spirit a spirit and soul eternal body not internal temp not eternal temporal so it has a life span and goes it's buried or it 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 ceases but the spirit and soul it, eternal right emotions uh memory recognition everything um we carry it with us into eternity right so um the spirit which is the eternal part of us so we realize okay this is spirit soul and body now saying may the god of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your you know the way you are composed spirit soul and body you, know, you be preserved blameless okay let nothing taint you in in any aspect of your of your you know how you are be it spirit be it soul be it body you now may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless um above reproach blameless at the coming of the lord so till the coming of the lord may be preserved blameless so he who calls is faithful and also the lord will do it he will do it okay. um so because he's saying may the god of peace sanctify you and may he preserve blameless but of course what is not mentioned there is that it requires our cooperation right we cannot say that i will live however i want to live and may the god of peace you know sanctify me completely and preserve me my spirit soul and body and keep it blameless at the, at it till is come till he comes at his coming well it requires me to cooperate it requires us as believers to cooperate okay fine finally he says um pray for us greet all the brethren with a holy kiss which was their you know customary traditional way of greeting one another uh, the men would greet one another in the same manner um, as the women would also do that so greet all with a holy kiss i charge you by the lord that this epistle be read to all so the same instruction which he gives the colossian church also that they read it in the in the other places so he says you know uh, let it be read to all let it be uh, given to all 
um, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Okay, so with that, we come to the end of uh, this First Thessalonians, and now let's move on to uh, Second Thessalonians. Okay, um, let me just project. I realized that I hadn't uploaded the uh, notes, so I'll do that. Both one, First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, um, I'll you know put it up. Okay, um, let me just project the notes for now. Okay. Okay. So we're looking at Second uh, Thessalonians. So Paul writes, and again here in Second Thessalonians also he's addressing the coming of the Lord. Okay, he's addressing some things about the coming of the Lord, and also he he, he addresses uh, you know some um, some teachings or some kind of a thought conversations that's been happening in the church saying uh, the day of the Lord has already come. The coming of the Lord has happened. It's already there and so on. So he's setting right those things as well. And he also uh, gives some instructions and that is towards the end in the chapter 3. So, um, so this seems to have been written um, very uh, soon after First Thessalonians, the epistle of First Thessalonians was sent, written and sent. Right, so this seems to have been written in quick succession, so around maybe eighty, fifty or so. Um, and scholars say it could have been, you know, maybe a few weeks after he wrote and sent uh, First Thessalonians. Right, so in in quick succession, not too much of time between the two epistles. Okay, so. Yeah, so let's look at, um, so these are some of the things that he is addressing, right, in the in this episode, um, that about the judgment of God when Christ returns, um, that we will, how as believers we will share in the glory of the Lord Jesus, and uh, and when he uh, when he comes back or before he comes back, um, he talks about the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, uh, and so on, right? And uh, and then finally, some instructions about uh, some uh, some practical uh, life applications for the believer in the church. Okay, so uh, he, he he talks about all this. Okay, so let's let's read. Okay, chapter one, verse one. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God. Our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to give thanks, to, sorry, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all of your persecutions and tribulations which you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer persecution. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance, on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you has been was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so Paul starts by saying, is, is you know, he wishes them in the traditional or the customary manner and also 
in a manner that he always does to the churches about grace and peace from God. Um, and so he, al he also says that, you know, he, he always give thanks to you, give thanks to God for you, because two things, right? The faith grows exceedingly. He has heard of the faith of the Thessalonians, which is, you know, which is growing. And their love for one another also abounds, you know. So this faith and love seems to be the hallmark of, or the uh, or the pillar of this church, or something that is very very expressive, something that really sets them apart. So they have their faith in God seems to be growing, and uh, it is put on display. Their love for one another is also something that is growing and abounding. And which is also something which is very noticeable, right? So he's saying, you know, we boast of you among the churches of God. We boast of you. And uh, we also boast about your patience and faith in all your tribulations, um, persecutions, which you endure. So, and all these other places, churches of God, you know, there is, we, we boast. Because we boast about your patience and faith, and your patience and faith when you are going through a um, lot of persecutions, a lot of tribulations. So, so this is something that is uh, happening in Thessalonica, and uh, even in the you know the previous epistle, Paul talks about that, talks about the um, you know the kind of tribulations that is happening and we we see that right he's saying you know uh, your faith your hope your labor of love uh, and and so on and uh, he talks about um, uh, uh, about the suffering their suffering and we also he also you know uh, talks about uh, uh, the, the way they went through and saying you know we went through all this. It's like an example for them, right? So we see that in First Thessalonians, and here, um, so he's saying that you are enduring this, and which is which itself is an evidence of the kingdom of God that you are chosen for worthy, counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer persecution. Okay, and uh, and one thing which he mentions is this: that no, don't forget that. God will repay. Now God, it is a righteous thing. Now it is not something unrighteous. It's a righteous thing for God to repay those who trouble you. Okay, so He'll bring about that. It is. It is not. You know, in case you wonder, you know, is somebody noticing all this? Is there justice in all this? Uh, you know, people are just continuing to do these things, and evil seems to be increasing. Well. Just remember that it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So God is watching. He is in control. He is definitely aware of all this. And it is something that is righteous for him to pay back, right? to repay all those who are troubling you right now. Okay, He says in verse 8, in um, uh, and to give you, sorry, verse 7, and to give you what troubled rest along with us. And the Lord is revealed. In flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so this is the reality of not, uh, not being saved. Okay, so those who, he says, those who are ignorant of God, you know, despite all the opportunities that God brings their way, despite you know all that, if they continue to be ignorant because of you know their own decision, right? So that is what Romans also talks about that they willingly exchange the truth for the lie, right? We we read about that. They exchange the truth for the lie, and uh, they did not want to retain the knowledge of God. In their hearts and minds, so it's a it's a choice, conscious choice. So here, saying that um, you know, on those who do not know God, there is a flaming fire uh, taking vengeance on those who do not know, and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord. The gospel is that salvation is in Christ alone. The gospel is that 
uh, Christ Jesus carried the sin and the consequence of it and every curse upon himself on the cross and those who believe in him should not perish. Those who believe in him, put their trust in him, should receive everlasting or eternal life. Now that is the, that is the gospel. Now those who do not obey the gospel also position themselves to, you know, to experience this wrath of God to experience the vengeance of the Lord. So that's the reality. Um, that is something that's that that is unchanging, unchangeable. This is something that will happen. As much as God is a God of love, as much as God is a God of patience, God is also the God of truth and holiness. And this is something that He has put down. No, it's not before He extends grace, right? He extends grace, he gives opportunities, but if people would reject and then they face the consequences of that rejection, okay, of not acceptance, of not accepting, right? Okay, so uh, verse 9, these shall be, she shall be fun, punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of the Lord. So this is what will happen. And when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, whereas those who believe and those who accept the Lord for them, it's a different thing. The, the, the coming of the Lord is something that they're looking forward to. They are admiring um, the Lord. They're worshiping, they're admiring and, uh, and doing all that. And uh, uh, because the apostles' testimony or whoever testified about Jesus was, you know, they believed that. So Paul is saying, you know, we also pray for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling. That, you know, in, in previous epistles, he said, you know, walk worthy of the Lord who has called you. Walk in a manner, which means live in a manner, conduct your life in a manner that is worthy of the Lord, worthy of the call of the Lord. So here, on a similar lines is saying um, that that you would we always pray for you that God would count you or God would count you worthy of this calling or is, is that God that God would say yeah uh, this person is living a life that is in line with the call it's worthy of the call of you know of the the call that I actually extended, he's living, he or she is living a life uh, which is worthy of the call. Okay, and, uh, and also fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified. So this is, this is God's desire, that his name will be glorified. Right, his position, his play, his power, uh, everything will be glorified in us and we in him okay um, according to his grace uh, which is the grace of the lord jesus christ okay let's look at chapter two okay so chapter two he's talking about you know it, it, it's again you know paul's way of addressing different topics right in corinthians we see now now concerning spiritual gifts now concerning food offered to idols right now concerning sexual immorality and then he talks about these things Right, he addresses these things. So here he's saying, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, uh, as through uh, the day of Christ had come. Okay. Okay, so um, so he's, he's addressing this whole thing about the coming of the Lord, and um, and so there seems to be some kind of a letter going around, uh, some kind of communication that is going around that the day of the Lord has already come. So he's going to be addressing that issue, correcting that wrong teaching. Okay, okay, so we'll take a break here and come back in uh, ten minutes.